Welcome to the Elite Physique Training Podcast. I'm your host, Gareth Sapstead. I'm going to say I'm a co-host, James Alters. <laughs> and on this podcast, we chat about some of the science, but more the practical applications of everything to do with physique development and looking great naked. Okay, so today we're going to be covering the topic of how to grow muscle fast. So, James, how do I get hedge? <laughs> What's the first thing we need to chat about when it comes to, to building muscle? Because there's a lot of... There's a lot of stuff out there, really. There's a lot of stuff that's confusing for our clients and why a lot of people come to us to, to make things super simple. What's the first thing I need to, need to understand? First things first, I think you need to have a good body composition to start with. So you want to be in a lean state rather than, you know, you get a client, they're potentially sloppy already, they're a bit softer than they want to be. From here, I'm looking to bring them down to a, a good level of body composition. Um, you can see your abs, you look good and then your body is a lot more responsive to the food we're about to put in and to the training we're about to do. And typically when you're doing a growth phase, there's normally an end goal. So normally they want to, you know, do a photo shoot, compete, go to the beach. So to get to that maximal body weight in a good body composition makes it a lot easier when they start their cut before getting ready for the show. That's interesting actually. So what you're saying is that in an ideal world, you'd have a little bit of time before dropping into that building phase to almost almost like a sensitization phase, right? Get them lean so their body's dealing really well with the nutrients so they can put those nutrients, calories to work to actually grow muscle. Yeah. So what so let's say I wanna I don't know, I wanna pack on 10 pounds this year, right? What's the first thing you would look at would it be would you prioritize nutrition would you prioritize training what's kind of the first thing you would look at so looking at their body composition first let's get that down to a good point let's see where we are then we want to manage the variables as best as possible so we want to look at your nutrition we want to look at your gym training are you training properly we want to look at your your output your cardio but i guess we we should probably start with something um a good gaining phase, probably looking at the nutrition first. Okay, so so here's one. So how many calories should I be on? Let's so let's mm. let's say, yeah, exactly. It's because it's a tough one, because you and I you and I both know it's not as simple as that. So let let's say I'm I don't know, let's say I've gone online, I've Googled a load of nutrition calculators on whatever website, we won't mention them, and it's come up with some figure. And that's going to allow me to, to grow muscle. Should I use that figure? Is there a better approach to knowing what my starting point should be? If you don't know what you're doing, that's better than doing nothing and just doing whatever you want. But um, personally, if I was to write your plan, um, I look at your body weight roughly. Then I try to look at your schedule in terms of your eating um, availability during the day based on work and stuff like that. And then I'm looking at how many meals, how many feeding can you get? And I'll split your protein allocation like through that. So if they're eating four or five times and I don't want them to have 200 grams of protein, I'll try to split that evenly-ish through those windows. Mm. So we've got 200, so we're looking at 40 grams of protein through, through five feeding feedings. Um, and then from there, I'm looking to fill out the rest of the calories, I think, based on my experiences with clients and myself, yeah. with the carbohydrates and fats. Um, I try to have fats earlier in the morning and in the, the evening, but the main thing with fats I try to do is to remove the fats around the training window as much as possible, just for digestion purposes, recovery, get the nutrients straight into the body after you train. Um, and then from there, I look to put the high amount of carbs around the window. And then as food goes up, we sort of stick around that window and then it sort of filters because obviously you get too much. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I probably, I probably use. It could be a similar approach, but so what I would tend to do is I would, you know, first off find around their maintenance calories. So in an ideal world, you've got someone starting off with you that knows roughly where they're at right now. Okay, and we're, we're lucky. We work with a lot of you know, elite level people or people that at least track their macros or stick to some kind of meal plan. Not everyone, but they know their starting point. They also know roughly what their weight's been doing recently. And that's the big one. Like, what calories are you on? 
what's your weight been doing? Okay, we know, right? We know what's happening. We know whether you're on maintenance calories. By definition, if you're on this amount of calories, regardless of what the calories are, and your weight has been the same, you are on maintenance calories. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you think they're too low and you've Googled it and it's too low or you Googled it and it's too high. By definition, if your weight hasn't changed, you're on maintenance calories, okay? If your weight's increased, well, you're obviously in a slight surplus, okay? So we know that starting point. And then it's just a simple case of, all right, we know to grow muscle, we need extra calories, extra nutrients. Good starting point might be, you know, extra 500 calories above maintenance as a rough starting point. But I think it's relative because if we have a bikini girl, maintenance or smaller, female, I say, because typically they're smaller, and she's 50 kilos eating 1500 calories to maintain her body weight, mm. and we put another 500 calories in, she's now on 2000, so she's increased by. 33%, whereas if I'm on 3,000, I've increased by what's that, half of that, 15, 16%. Yep. So it's, it's all relative, but for what? the average male, yeah. you're looking at getting three, 400 calories. But what I was saying earlier about setting up the diet, I'm sort of doing that to assess and work out the maintenance first. Yep. Yep. So I've set out what I think works, and then I set them off for five, seven, It's almost like days. a shot in the dark at the start, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it's based on all the, yeah. the body weights, um, what they tell you about their training experience, mm. what they look like, and just how they communicate in terms of when you fill in a consultation form and you give me a lot of details, I can tell you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, base it on all those things put together, boom, take that away, let's see what, you, what your body weight does. And if we're looking to, to, to gain weight and you gained two kilos in the first week, we, you know, I've, I've overshot it. Yeah. And then I'll pull back. And there's no reason why you can't pull back. So yeah. it's... it's it's just about this, same as the dieting phase, it's just about assessing um, training performance, feedback from the clients, and just working together in open communication. Yeah, I, I think as well, just understanding what their base level of activity is, is so important. Like we had a discussion a few days ago and, and you asked if we could add as a standardized question what their step count was. Now. Before you suggesting that, we basically just had a, you know, what, what's your perceived level of activity, you know, sedentary, highly active, on a, on a scale. And I think a lot of people see, especially at the moment more so, people see the whole step count thing a lot more, like target step count, and they kind of wonder what it's about. Well, the way I kind of see step count is, is that it's just a basic way, basic understanding of how active are you. If you're someone that's doing... 2,000 steps a day versus someone that's doing 12,000 steps a day, well, you know that the person that's on 12,000 steps a day is probably going to be needing more calories than the person that's on 2,000 steps a day. It, it's Again, it, it helps with that kind of shot in the dark to start off with. I think the issue is when you have those questions which comes to those calculators, it's like, yeah. how active am I? Well, I, I feel fucking tired at the end of the day, so I'm, I must be fairly active, although I sit at a desk, but I have a child, so I'm running around. But it's, it's, it gives us an actual figure yeah. of one thing that we can actually track, which is steps. Um, I know we're talking about bulking today, but a good example of the importance of steps is I know for sure when I'm in a dieting phase, I don't want to move. Yeah. Subconsciously, you don't want to move. You actually want to speak, let alone walk. So what happens is your calories go down. Subconsciously, you stop moving. Yeah. So this is one variable we can track. So instead of my calories going down and my output slightly going down as well and uh, reducing the impact of what we're trying to do, which it might be a fat loss phase or mm. I'm sure it works the other way as well, we just keep that consistent. Yeah. Um, so we've got something to, to monitor, keep your steps in, you might have to, it's just something that, it's another box to tick yeah. um, and it allows for better accountability and just consistency along the process. So the same way that happens with a, a dieting phase, it's the same with a, a fat loss phase, oh, a growing phase, sorry. Because, yes, we're trying to grow, but we still want to keep, like I said at the start, body composition in a good place. Yeah. So I like to actually keep some level of cardio in. Um, one keeps body composition in a good spot. Yeah. But it also it's good for heart health. Yeah. As well as routine. Because this is a good question here. Because obviously what normally happens is, I'm in a building phase, I'm in a bulking phase. That's it, no cardio. Yeah. Okay. So actually, this is a really good question, James. Like, does cardio kill your gains? <laughs> no, everything everything's monitored, everything's tracked. Yeah. So everything's tracked. So it should your heart is 
uh, a muscle just like everything else. So it needs to be trained. Mm. So like we said earlier, if, if you're not doing any steps, you're not doing any cardio, and you're eating loads of food, yes. it's a recipe to just get fat. Um, so I, what myself, now I'm on a 45 minutes cardio, which is a fair amount, but I was on two hours pre, uh, so I just competed not long ago. Um, if anyone doesn't know. So I was on two hours cardio, so now I've gone down to 45. Like, that's more than a 50% reduction. Yeah. That's a big change. Yeah. But to someone else looking in, that's still a lot of cardio. But yeah. it's all relative to where you were and to where you're going. So as I keep going into this growing phase, it will sort of slow, it will come down gradually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we also know that from a building muscle standpoint, that volume is a big driver of that. And obviously having the nutrients, calories coming in allows you to recover faster from achieving a higher level of volume, you know, or volume load with the load that you're using as well at the same time. Now, cardio, people always forget, obviously, heart health, which is great. And you want to maintain that health as well. But it's also improving your work capacity. To say you become unfit because you've suddenly dropped to zero cardio, well, actually, your strength workouts are going to start to suffer and more so towards the back end of those workouts. If you're gassed out, from doing sets of 10, <laughs> then obviously your work capacity needs to improve. But that sort of goes on to another question on yeah. in terms of what rep ranges are you supposed to be working in as you're trying to build? Okay. Trying to build so awesome? let's, let's go on to this one, the training. Yeah. Yeah. So well, let's, we'll come back to nutrition. Okay, we'll, I feel like we're still Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, ch we try and keep, we got to try and keep these podcasts <laughs> relatively short. <laughs> but we could, this could be a, a yeah, big topic. There's a lot the, of yeah. variables to, to track. Think, let's, let's stick to kind of top level stuff here. Okay. So, okay, training. So let's start out with, is there a best training split to build muscle? Training split? Training split. No, because if you're looking at top level people who are, not even top level, but... Not a beginner athlete, so intermediate and above, you typically have areas that you want to improve. So even if it's just to go on a beach, you know that you've been training, you've been tracking, you've been doing certain things, and you probably notice that maybe potential different muscle groups are not up to speed with the rest. So for example, if my chest was lagging, I'd prioritize that in my training, and you'd see that with the, the amount of volume split across the week in terms of that. Whether or not it's more on a... I've got more chest training in one session, or I've got chest coming in different parts of the week. Yeah. Um, that's sort of person dependent based on recovery. Okay, yeah. I think because, so we both just had an article come out this week at tnation.com where we covered the best exercises for every body part. Not really the best exercises, but like meat and potatoes exercises that people should stick to, just nailing those basics. So in, do you have an idea about what the best exercises are? Do they change individually? What What's kind of your take on the whole, what exercises should I be using if I want to build maximum muscle? I had this conversation with a client, I can't remember who it was, the other day. Um, there is no best exercise. There are your, your staples, but they don't have to be your staples. It's the sort of movement patterns which are replicated on a bench press or a chest press. Um, so who was it, I can't remember the client. But I remember he was doing squat lifts, squats and deadlifts in his training plan, but he's getting loads of fatigue and he's not recovering and his lower back's hurting. And um, I said, look, let's take one out. Mm. We can replace the, the back squats with a, with a leg press and we'll drive just as much um, intensity through, through your legs, mm. but half the load on your back when you're only doing a deadlift. Yeah. What do you think? I completely agree. Like, it, I, I, I think a lot of people have a bias towards things that they like to do and want to do. So in, in, that, in that example you're giving there, that person might really want to be deadlifting because they've almost been conditioned to think a deadlift is the best exercise to pack on muscle, okay? But what's happened? Well, their back's getting cranky, right? So, okay, well, let's cho either chop it out or reduce the volume of it and just see what happens. Because at the end of the day, you and I both know there's no best exercise to grow each body part. It's going to vary individually. Mm -hmm. Both you and I have issues with back squats, right? So, you know, for you, it's a leg press a lot of the time. For quads hypertrophy, it's a leg press. For me, love a hack squat, love a leg press. You know, I sometimes use a trap bar as a squat. Um, but those are my two staples, and I'm happy to stick with a leg press or a hack squat. 
for 365 days. Well, not obviously for 365 days of the year. <laughs> like the every I'm, day. Not, I'm not like that every day, <laughs> trust me. But, you know, once or twice a week, I'm happy. I can stick with that and vary the rep ranges, whatever, throughout the entire year. Or maybe for one phase of eight weeks yeah. or whatever, I might do a leg press for my quads. And then for the next phase, for another maybe eight weeks, it might be a hack squat. And then I might come back to the leg press yeah. and back to the hack squat, right? And so, you know, even just you, you and I as an example, because of past injuries, cranky knees, whatever, the best exercises for us isn't going to be something like a barbell back squat. And But, you know, conversely, there's a lot of people where a barbell back squat can be a, a great exercise. Like, there is no best exercise. The best exercise for you, what do you engage with best? So, like you said, I don't back squat because I know if I do and I put enough weight on the bar to stimulate what I need to my legs, my quads or whatever, my sessions tomorrow and the next day, which might be chest or back or whatever else I have to do, I I can still feel it yeah. and it takes away from that session. So overall, if I'm going to do one exercise, it's going to take away from all the others or for the next few days, it's, it's counterproductive. Yeah. So I want to just train my legs. I don't want to be injured. So, so I, don't, I don't do them. I can't remember last time I've done them. It's, it's like, I, 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 love, I love the phrase, you know, train hard, but recover harder. Mm. You know, you, 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 training is just the stimulus right you're not training for your ego you're not training to i'm sorry you're not training to feel good about yourself you're not training to walk out the gym sweaty and be like yes i've had a great workout sweat how sore you are the next day isn't necessarily an indicator of how effective that workout was it's a case of we we stimulate not annihilate the body and then we go home we eat we recover we, we sleep etc that's interesting but because there's this new thing of training to failure yeah but you can still train to failure and still recover. Yeah. And that just comes down to managing the volume you can recover from. Yeah, so yeah. if you're absolutely fucked, I don't know if we're swearing or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we do whatever. We do whatever. <laughs> if you're absolutely open. wrecked yeah. um, from doing, I don't know, I've gone in and I've done eight exercises and I've done, I don't know, 12 top sets on a, I don't know, a, on, on back today. Yeah. But tomorrow I'm still wrecked. I can't do legs. Mm. If I take that 12 top sets down to eight, and then I can train tomorrow and do my legs, and the next day I can either rest or put in another four yep. working sets of my back along with, I don't know, maybe another week of body part, like my shoulders, and I'm still recovering, that's a lot more productive and yeah. I'm gonna see better results in the long run. Yeah. You know what? And, and we're kind of, I think we're gonna find this on this podcast, us going <laughs> off topic quite a bit. Go back. Um, but on the, obviously, we're talking about growing muscle tissue, okay? One of the big things of the moment is one set to failure, right? It's a big thing at the moment. Just what are your the back off. Okay, okay. That's the... What are your thoughts on the general idea behind that? I'm all for it, depending on your training experience. Mm. So if clients are not experienced enough to know what a top set feels like and hitting a true failure on, what are you looking at, six to ten reps, six to eight reps, or that sort of smaller range, there's no point programming it because it's just a shit set. Yeah. So I'd rather program in three sets of 10 to 12, so the intensity is slightly higher, yeah. but then the volume's increased to sort of, to increase the intensity overall. Yeah. You know what, I, no, I, I, I'm the exact train of thought. What it were, you know what? It's some, this one set to failure, however you want to do that, works quite well for in-person coaching because you as a coach in person can gauge how close that person actually is to failure, right? You and I both know that by themselves, they might've been doing 10 reps and thinking that that was failure, but they probably had another five in the tank. If you just like, come on, and another, and another, and another. Like okay, a, that's a set to failure. I had the conversation with a client as well. Yeah. He sent a video yeah. and I was like, more weight, more weight, more weight. And I started to explain to him because I was like, I keep saying the same thing. The reason I know you need more weight is because your last rep, the bar is moving like, it's just so fast. Yeah. So if you're squatting, you're like, bam, bam, and you're finished, you're not finished. Yeah. Your last set should be hard. And I'm all for training hard, mm. and I'm all for form. However, when you're actually pushing hard, I feel like your form is going to deteriorate slightly. It needs to be within, you know, 80%. Yeah. But... To, to train really fucking hard, your form is going to slip towards the back end, and, and I'm all for it. As long as you're, depending on the exercise, yeah. and you're, you're doing it safely, 
then then fucking train hard. Yeah, and, that, and that's why, from an online coaching perspective, although like clients give us form check videos and whatever, it's a lot hard to manage that one set to failure thing and make it actually an effective approach to training because we don't, we can't really gauge effectively if it's a true set to failure. Technique might go, well, technique does go out the window with a lot of people, et cetera. Whereas you know, in person, yeah, when it comes to programming for online, then it tends to be, yeah, two, three, two, three, four sets, whatever. Because you get, like I said, you get one video, mm. which might be their one top set on one stick of exercise. Set. Exactly. <laughs> and you're probably the same as me. Like, yeah. I know the camera's on and I need to fucking push it. Yes. So you get that extra rep. Um, so, yeah. And I also, I when I program, it will. So if I've had an experienced client, mm. I like to program to failure to on a maybe on a Swift machine rather than a bench press because I know they can still do that yes. without a spot. So sort okay, of. machines then, right? Yeah. So benefits of machines. So I've got my own thoughts about machines. Apps. I do love them, especially you know some you know really high level athletes, you know Olympians and stuff that I work with during prep or especially those later stages of prep mm -hmm. massive 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 fan of machines obviously providing that machine fits you well <laughs> it feels nice whatever because you can get closer to failure safely yeah. as it, it, it's as simple as that you get all these people that are talking about lack of stabilization activity blah 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 you know you're, you're not working stabilizer muscles it's not functional whatever but we've always got to think about the context of things as well it's risk versus reward exactly quite simply with every exercise Wherever it's everything, yeah. But when you're in a the depths of a prep, mm. you are more open to injuries. You're you're just more tired. Mm. I know I feel it. So I now moved out of a prep. So now I was on the dumbbells last week. Mm. I haven't touched a dumbbell in ages because just to, to flick it onto my knee and then to rock it back, that's a lot of energy. Yeah, that's yeah, a lot yeah. of stress. Whereas in prep, I just I'm working my chest. So I can just sit on the machine and just press. Yeah. And you focus all my energy on this. Whereas now I've got a little bit more energy, I've got a little bit more food. Yeah. I can allocate it where I want. So now I can work the stabilizer muscles. At the back end of prep, it's about keeping the muscle you build yeah. rather than building it. So I guess we're kind of diverting. But yeah. We're, back to it's, we're, we're still talking about <laughs> building muscle at the end of the day, we'll the day aren't we? I think the difference being, if, if, you're in a, if you're in a prep, you just don't have the calories spare. You, you, you're training yeah. in a very similar way to stimulate building muscle, even during the prep, because the best case scenario is that you're retaining the muscle by training to build muscle yeah. when in a calorie deficit. Yeah. Yeah? You're trying, yeah, you're just trying to stimulate it yeah. just as much. If you, if you can progress mm. and still beat your numbers, mm. I'm all for it, go for it. Yeah. But just do it in the safest environment possible. 100%, yeah. What do you think about uh, rep ranges changing during a prep to a uh, <sighs> growing phase to a dieting phase? Yeah, that, that's a difficult one. So, I, we know, for, so look, there's a lot of research stuff that goes out there and little uh, Instagram images that say you can build muscle at five reps, but you can also build muscle at 30 reps, so it doesn't matter, okay? However, let's apply that, right? Now, we were talking about training to failure earlier. What we know about building muscle is that you do need to get relatively close to failure. You don't need to get to failure, but generally speaking, you know, if you're, if you're five, six reps short of failure, it's not a very stimulating set. But if you're one to two reps short of technical failure, good form, then it's a good stimulating set, right? If we're trying to go for 30 reps, 20 reps, me, anything over 12, right? Okay. <laughs> form, form does start to deteriorate, but then the cardiovascular system also kicks in. I just don't feel a lot of people have the mentality to use that higher rep range to get close enough to achieving failure. Within the parameters of a clean form. Exactly, within yeah. clean form. Whereas, if you're programming more, let's say, let's say eight to 10 reps, okay? You spend a lot of your time there. People are more likely to achieve closer to the degree of failure for it to be a good stimulating set within that eight to 10 range than they would be in that super high rep range. When it comes to like five reps, six reps, I think there's a place maybe in the off season, maybe yeah. if you're really focused on that time under tension, you, maybe some slow eccentrics you're employing, maybe if you want to just increase the time under tension. 
But I think what happens there is that then the load becomes so great that people forget about what we're trying to do, what muscle are we mm. trying to stimulate. Has my bench press now suddenly become a powerlifting style bench press where I'm thinking about how much weight I can lift mm -hmm. rather than a bench press where I'm thinking about it as a tool yeah. to stimulate my chest. Ego, I think, takes over when you go low. So for me personally, the rep ranges that I might use would not change too much whether you've got calories or you don't. I tend to use a bit of a mix of rep ranges. Um, so I might do one phase that might focus on a higher end hypertrophy range. So for me, maybe eight to 15, it might be. So quite broad there. Whereas maybe a phase afterwards might, might be within that six to eight rep range, maybe, but only for a few exercises. Back end of your workout, sure, some metabolic stress style stuff, some get some reps in there, do some 21s, whatever. Yeah, that's what goes on to what I'm thinking where, one, it's about what the client enjoys. Yeah. What are the experiences that keep saying the same thing? Yeah. But if they don't enjoy working in five to eight or eight to 10, so I guess it shows in their programming anyway. But um, towards the start of an ex uh, a workout, you program in your compounds normally. That's yeah. typically, might not be very first, but it's normally quite early it's on. It's there, yeah. yeah. So you might have some isometrics to to get warm, but then you might chuck a squat in. So then you're working, you can work in a lower rep range of eight to 10 because like you said, once I start squatting and I'm doing 15 to 20 reps mm. with all these stabilizing muscles in play there's a lot more risk for injury yeah so if my compounds are in early as so i'm squatting i can do eight to ten or six to eight then towards the back end of my workout we can use the leg press and we can work that higher rep range so we're still getting a bit of everything done yeah okay so let's go on to the next question now obviously people have got some ideas hopefully about what's involved within a successful kind of build phase um, rough rep ranges, exercise, etc. Or people might be even more confused, maybe <laughs> at this point, because like both of us just keep wanting to keep wanting to say like it depends. Yeah. Like, and that's that's the boring truth of it all. Is like, plug. yeah, jump into DMs. Ask yeah, 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 jump into the DMs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So online coaching, guys, if you want to just jump in the DMs. No. Okay. So, <laughs> what are some of the key characteristics you see within the clients that that you work with? And and I could ch obviously chat about the clients that I work with as well. Um, you know, and, and us as a team, that results in an effective uh, build phase. I'll let you go first. I go first. I'll okay. First. Okay. One of my pet peeves is check-ins. Okay. You can always see whether it be you know build phase, fat loss phase, whatever phase that that client's in. You can always see how. Um, how likely that person is to achieve a level of success based on uh, their check-ins with you. So the way we tend to do check-ins is, you know, our clients can literally message us anytime they want to send form check videos, whatever they want to. But then we do like a weekly accountability form and monitoring form. Simply, you know, normally send out, send out every, every weekend and it's, it takes two minutes to fill out just to get a perception of what was your sleep like this week? What was your, what was your muscle soreness that, like this week? What was your recovery? Is there anything we need to change we haven't discussed, et cetera? Just, just basic questions for that extra level of accountability. But sometimes I don't get mine back till Wednesday, Thursday. Well, you're still week. getting it. I'm still getting it. So the ones that you don't get yeah. is normally because they're not on track. And I can speak yes. myself, even as a coach. Yeah. I finished my last show and I kind of stopped checking in. Yeah. I just turned pro, just check it out there. <laughs> but anyway, I just turned pro and it was a bit like, oh, now what? Because I had loads of shows planned. So I was yeah. like, I was a bit lost. So I was eating everything yeah. in sight. So I was like, I'm not checking in. It's embarrassing. So you lost focus. So you so stopped you checking, stopped checking in. in. So you know yeah. if someone, especially if they normally do check in all year yeah. and then they sort of stop. Yeah. By the way, I'm checking in again. Um, <laughs> they stop checking in. You can sort of assume something's not going right. Maybe they're not training, maybe they're not eating properly. Yeah. Or well, they're just stressed to work. Obviously, we touch base. Um, but if they really don't want to be contacted, you won't hear from them for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for a few days until they're back. And then normally when they, when they do communicate back, yeah. they're ready to roll again anyway. So it's, yes. you know. The, the, the other one is just simply, and, and, and we both talk about it all the time, just tick the boxes, right? The, the thing that we do as coaches is we set the boxes out for you each week that you've got to tick. And obviously, you know, some people tick more boxes than others. You have some people that are complete robots and will just head down, tick the boxes, check-ins on time, boom, next week, rinse, 
and repeat. But that goes down to their goals. So it's yeah. like, I'd expect, if you're telling me I want to turn pro, I'd expect you to tick all your boxes because yeah. if you want to be a pro, you need to act like a pro. Whereas if you are a lifestyle client, I expect you to not tick every box because I, especially this time of year, we're, we're cause obviously you might watch it at a different time, but we're in December, mm. Christmas is coming, a lot of clients in America, so they've just had Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year. So you will have work dues, family dinners and things like that. And that's okay. Yeah. It is nice for you to still touch base and send a picture or, or send a check-in picture and, and let us know. But we do expect you to live your life. That's why you're a lifestyle client. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like I had a message this morning from a client who's... Um, she, she was a Masters Olympian bikini. Um, and she... So she's a coach herself. And she's at a few... Comp- she's, got, she's at a competition this weekend. She's travelling. She's flying, I think, today. She's off all, off all weekend. Reality, she can't really train over those days. Or if she does, it's just not going to be that great. But simple message to me, like, you know, training's going to be off track this week, um, you know, just, just so you know. You know that that person, well, there's a reason why that person has got to that level. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and she's a coach herself. She, she understands things as yeah. well. And she doesn't have to tell me. Like, we see on our dashboard if someone's missing workouts. Mm-hmm. But it's just that extra thing of they're, they're very trusting in you. They're very kind of reliant on you to, to make sure that they're doing the exact things that they need to. But it's like we set out these tasks, we set out these tick boxes, we set your training, we set your nutrition, we set your cardio, your steps, blah, blah, blah. But it's how important is it to you as a person yeah. to... Because we can only show, what is it? We can only show you the doors, your job to walk through it. Yeah. So I've put all this thing, these stuff here ready for you to make the progress you want. If, if you don't do it, that's, that's kind of on you. And what, if you're doing it and it's not working, then it's on me. Yeah. But you also have to communicate that to us because... I don't, I don't fucking know what you're doing or what the hell is that? if you're yeah. not checking in I don't really know so if you're not recovering from the training because there's too much volume and you're not putting it in your check-in form or making a note of it to me I can't adjust it Yeah. or if an exercise doesn't feel right or it hurts you don't tell me I don't know I'm not going to change it Yeah. we're not magicians we're kind of <laughs> kind of <laughs> as much as we want to be we're, we're not quite there but we're getting there we're getting, we're getting there, there. Yeah. we're getting there we're getting there I think on that note, I think this is a good place to finish. Hang on, hang on. We haven't actually answered the question. Oh, go on then. The question was, <laughs> what makes, what are the most thing, important things that we see that dictate a successful yeah. growing phase to a uh, unsuccessful? Yeah. Obviously, we touched on one, which is regular check-ins. Yeah. And I guess it's just ticking your boxes like you would in a prep or in a shoot phase, um, a photo shoot prep. Um, so it's just doing the things like you do, creating a routine, we spoke about this earlier, and it was about, you're not always motivated. Yeah. I'm not always motivated, you're not always motivated. But when you have that routine and that consistency, the results shine. Yeah, it's almost, you're, you're engineering that motivation just by giving routine to that person, aren't you? And then I suppose it's making sure that that person is at a right place in their life where they can make that a priority as well. But we also, we're going to go on forever. Yeah, but yeah, we, yeah. I know you do the same when you program around their life. Yeah. So I know if you've got, I don't know, a family and kids, and you've got a free meal sometimes. Mm. Have that with your family. Or if you can't eat during work, I'll make you have a, a protein shake because no one knows what's in your shaker. Yeah. So there's ways around things. There's always work around. Exactly. Always a work around. Exactly. I think people that say they don't have time, well, no, you don't not have time. You've just not made it a priority. Yeah. Right? One of my things is, well, Pull up your, you know, pull up the, the your phone yeah. and just check out your social media hours. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you spent four hours a day scrolling through Instagram. Well, maybe you can make that three hours and put one hour into your training, maybe. And, and your meal prep. <laughs> and your meal prep. And yeah. then you want to spend two hours, you can scroll and walk. <laughs> exactly. You can you can do it whilst you're on the treadmill. Yeah. Exactly. So I think you know we we can talk for ages. Yeah. So I, I think we'll finish we'll finish the podcast there. It's a nice place to kind of end things. Um, Make sure you follow, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube if you see it on YouTube as a video. Um, remember, we do offer coaching services. You can head to our own Instagram pages, for example, um, James Walters IFBB Pro, um, at the Fitness Maverick, or at Elite Physique Training if you want to, um, or the fitnessmaverick.com forward slash online coaching. And if there are topics you want us to discuss or we need to touch further on this one, drop a comment below or let us know in our DMs. And we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, we'll just be look. We'll just be dictated to you. We're pretty chill about whatever. You know, we're pretty much open books. We can chat about 
literally we can we can chat about anything and go off tangent so whatever you want us guys to chat about just drop it in the comments below um and we will make it our next podcast <laughs>